Hi, does math make you nightmare, nightmare, nightmare? Well, then you simply must check out the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant.org. As creatives, I'm assuming you are one since you're watching this video, we tend to be not great with analytical skills. And that can cause problems when we operate in the business world. I'm kind of scared of making mistakes in my invoices or getting fined for taxes or anything remotely in the math realm. At least I would be if I didn't have Brilliant. Anyone can be sharper, me most of all, and the training I need to stay sharp for my personal accounting and secretary work is right here. But there's more, of course. Like, how are you gonna exist in 2023 and not know anything about computer science? Come on. Really though, the thing that's always worried me the most about learning mathematical skills was memorization. That's the way it was in school, that's our cultural conception of this type of thing. But Brilliant doesn't just dump equations on you and expect you to retain them. Instead, it's built around interactivity. So instead of just watching a lecture, you participate. And it turns you into the sharpest, brightest, and most prepared version of yourself. For a 30-day free trial of Brilliance, go to brilliant.org slash local or click the link in my description. The first 20 people to do this will get 20% off a premium subscription. First name cable, last name management. Anywho, what are the nine types? We got the one. Something's wrong and they're going to fix it because they know better. We got the two. The two wants to feel wanted and worthy. The three, they want to feel above people. Status image. The four is all about protecting their own individuality. The five, they gotta know what's up. Understanding the world makes it feel like less of a threat. The six, it's all about alignment and security. The seven, avoid pain, avoid negative emotions, stay boolean, stay stimulated. The eight, control everything. They are to controlling what fives are to understanding. It makes them feel more secure. And the nine, harmony. Avoiding conflict, avoiding overstimulation, keeping the peace. That's a very general rundown. This is not a psychology channel. For our purposes, I just need you to know this. The Enneagram doesn't cover your career, or how happy or sad you are, or what your hobbies are, or how you dress. None of that. All of those factors are stereotypes. The Enneagram is only concerned with your core motivation. Let's say a person dresses in extravagant flamboyant clothing. Despite this big outward trait, we still have no idea what the person's Enneagram type is. A one might dress extravagantly because they believe it's the proper thing to do in their circumstances. A two might dress extravagantly because they feel it brings the people around them joy. A three might dress extravagantly because the attention affirms their self-worth. A four might dress extravagantly because they feel it's a reflection of their unique inner self. A five might dress extravagantly as a personal social experiment, or maybe the persona is a way of keeping the world at arm's length. A six might dress extravagantly because that's their way of achieving solidarity with those around them. A seven might dress extravagantly because of the novel and entertaining situations that arise because of it. An eight might dress extravagantly as a dominance display or a defense mechanism in certain environments. And a nine might dress extravagantly because in their particular circumstances, that's the route of least confrontation. Now, some of these situations are obviously more plausible than others, and that's my point kind of. The reason fours sometimes get the flamboyant stereotype is because in situations where uniforms and dress codes are the norm, their four sensibilities very well may compel them to distinguish themselves visually. But a four's core desire to affirm their individuality could just as easily manifest in the form of a quiet hobby. Understanding the Enneagram is about getting to the underlying drives behind why people do what they do. But identifying a character's type is only half the battle. To really utilize the Enneagram in writing, you have to understand the spectrum of health within each type. Because if you know what the healthiest and unhealthiest versions of your character would look like, then you have the makings of an arc. For instance, type one, the reformer. Ones are moralizing, they have a strong sense of justice, they're driven by a harsh inner critic. Now, the healthiest version of the one is someone who understands the potential of everyone and everything to do better. That type one need to correct the world manifests in a patient, positive, and non-egotistical way. They understand that they're not perfect either, and they strive to improve themselves as well as the corrupt world around them. But on the other end of the spectrum is the unhealthy one. They have the same fundamental drive, but it shows up as a massive superiority complex. They basically have to be in denial about their imperfections. They are more noble than everyone around them. They know the truth, and they will force their truth on the world as judge, jury, and executioner. They refuse to see nuance. A thing is either good and pure, or it's evil and rotten. 
they experience an almost divine calling to cleanse. Josh Keefe, who I really hope is okay, has some fantastic Enneagram videos. And in his breakdown of the Type 1, he uses a variety of fictional characters to showcase the full spectrum of health within that type. When I first watched it, the revelation that Hermione and Thanos operate from the same core drive was mind-boggling to me. Again, a testament to the deeper truth captured by the Enneagram model. And once again, I must stress that the Enneagram is not a prescriptive science. Even if you've never heard of the Enneagram, you will still write characters belonging to the nine types. I would even go so far as to say that a significant character in your narrative cannot be consistent if they fall outside of the Enneagram, because it's a simple but very comprehensive model that accounts for the full range of human motivation. Again, a model, a man-made tool we use to understand the human condition. If you approach personality theories thinking they're trying to describe hard scientific truths, you're going to have a problem with them because that's not what they're for. And you know, I don't even blame you for this misconception because even the Enneagram gets up its own ass a little bit. Like, I think the Enneagram creators need to have this perfect symmetrical symbol led to some stretches, we'll say. Part of the Enneagram theory is that when you're on the higher end of the health spectrum, you take on the traits of another type. Like the healthy one takes on the carefree attitude of the seven, but an unhealthy one takes on the worst traits of the four, their irrationality and disconnection from the facts. I don't like this aspect of the Enneagram. I think it's extremely misleading to say that a healthy one moves to seven, because even though a healthy one might take on some of the behavioral traits of a seven, they're still not stemming from a seven motivation, they're coming from a one, because you're a one. Why is it not enough to say that a healthy one can let go of their rigid perfectionism and just let things be sometimes? Why must we draw a false equivalency to another type that does the same thing, but for a completely different reason? An unhealthy one becomes irrational, like Thanos. And the Enneagram goes, oh, just like a four. And I'm like, sorry, what? Oh, well, unhealthy fours are irrational too. Well, yeah, but like in a self-loathing, avoidant way. Thanos is a homicidal maniac. The worst version of a one looks nothing like the worst version of a four. That's a completely different kind of irrationality. Sure, if you describe the two in the most general terms possible, yeah, I guess they are both being irrational in the same way that a pineapple and a fart could both be described as ripe. And that's not even the worst example. For type nine, they try to claim that unhealthy type nines adopt the characteristics of type sixes. Oh, so like rigid tribalism and in-group, out-group thinking predicated on the obsessive need for security? No, no, just anxiety. Just the feeling of anxiety. I've seen nine anxiety. Nine anxiety is nothing like six anxiety because nines are nothing like sixes. The novelty of connecting all these types is fun and exciting, but it ultimately hurts the theory. Sometimes I wonder if this symbol was devised by a type one who felt the need to bend logic to create the most perfect symmetrical piece of iconography. Like there's also the concept of a wing. Your wing is your secondary number that is either the number immediately to your left or to your right. So an eight must either be an eight wing seven or an eight wing nine. I've decided that I don't like wings and will not use them. My reasoning is basically the same as it was for the growth and stress moves. Like the eight wing seven inherits the seven's extroversion, but not the seven's conflict avoidance or thrill seeking. I'll admit that my distaste for the symbol started as an argument from personal incredulity. I was just like, there is no way that the human brain works specifically like this with all of the da, 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 and the do, 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 do. But when I actually looked into it with an open mind or a mind that was as open as I could open it, yeah, it stinks. As far as I'm concerned, the only subcategory that genuinely adds to this theory is the instinctual subtypes. Social, self-preservation, and sexual. Instinctual subtypes exist outside of the symbol, so they were granted permission to make sense. I'm not really gonna get into instinctual subtypes in this video, but essentially, the social instinct is your need for structure and community. The self-preservation instinct is your desire to handle threats and acquire physical necessities. The sexual instinct is not literally sexual, it just involves your need to foster one-to-one -one emotional bonds with other people. One of these three instincts takes priority for you. 
Each of us has all three, but the order varies from person to person, so we can designate people by their highest ranking instinct. A self-preservation aide is an aide who puts their physical needs first. A sexual aide is gonna be an aide who prioritizes those deep emotional connections with others. And a social aide is going to be an aide who operates, first and foremost, with society and hierarchy in mind. The instincts cannot be overlooked. If you want more information on how the instincts interact with the Enneagram types, I highly recommend You've Got a Type. Uh, this guy is the most efficient explainer of all things Enneagram. Granted, we would disagree on the value of the wings and the arrows of growth and stress. In summary, my advice for someone who wants to use the Enneagram as a writing tool is this. Only focus on the nine types, the different levels of health within each type, and the three instinctual variants. Throw the rest in the trash. Dead serious. The Enneagram is at its most useful when it cuts through the bullshit and examines the fundamental differences between people. Now that's not to say that some pairings of types aren't more poignant than others. As much as I hate the lie of moving to another type, it's true that some types are very clearly lacking in traits that other types have in abundance. As per Josh, Christopher Nolan's Batman is a type one and his Joker is a type seven. And it's true that the chaos of the seven and the order of the one slot naturally into each other and lead to intense dramatic situations that you might not be able to get by pairing up a one and a two or a seven and an eight. For this reason, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to explore the different dynamics that the Enneagram theory posits exists between its different types. Just as long as you understand that a seven will never truly be like a one, just like a one will never truly be like a seven. I thought I was an eight for years because as soon as I got out of high school, I decided that I was going to be Mr. Serious Businessman and that the world was my chessboard and I was angry and that's kind of just the eight stereotype. But somebody commented under the dialogue video that I was very likely not an eight and after a bit of digging, I concluded that they were right. An eight would not let one negative YouTube comment fester into a PR-obsessed anxiety episode, which I've definitely done once or twice. An eight wouldn't even be in the comments section looking for validation at all. I've also had people on YouTube tell me that I'm probably a five. This is because the stereotypical five is very technical and objective. And people see me being all surgical in my videos, and they assume it's because understanding how things work makes me feel more secure. But what they don't realize is just how much I get off on being the best understander. I'm most likely a three. I've always conceptualized my worth as the sum of my external achievements. Existing has never been enough for me. You know, because everybody exists and my identity is tied to shame or something. I, I'm not that deep into it yet. And when I realized this about myself, a lot of other things slotted eerily into place. Once again, my need to find objective structure in writing seems like a five thing, but only if you assume that I'm pursuing truth for its own sake. See, part of the three's core wound is an invalidation of the subjective experience. That's why they turn to external sources, numbers they can watch tick up to affirm their worth, like their bank account balance, or their number of followers, or their number of friends. So what happens when you take a person who places no value on the subjective experience and drop them into the highly subjective world of art? Well, I'm probably going to start looking for objective metrics I can use to grade my art's quality because how I feel about it is irrelevant. That's my threeness manifesting in a way that's not stereotypically three-ish. That's why the Enneagram infographics you find when you Google search Enneagram have never been anything but harmful to the theory's credibility. Trying to represent the types with fun color palettes and icons and stereotypes is antithetical to what they are, which is the uncanny embodiment of purpose over personality. And look, as far as my own self-analysis goes, I could be way off. Hot take, I don't think people are automatically experts on themselves purely by virtue of being themselves. We're animals. There's no clause in our contract with nature that this thing is under any obligation to make sense to us. But we're smart, don't get me wrong. I think we all have the potential to become experts on ourselves. But that journey takes years of mindfulness and training. It's very naive of us to think that we are incapable of self-deception. Self-deception is at the core of so much personality theory and behavioral psychology and therapy. It's very well understood that we do things to meet subconscious needs 
and then fill the logical holes with less incriminating head cannons. I, for one, am just beginning to realize after 21 years of being alive and being me and having my brain that I work excessively hard on my creative projects, specifically when my self-esteem is low. It can be a coping mechanism. I didn't catch on to this until recently because the conscious feeling I get from being a workaholic is a high. Before my research, I had never thought to question where that positive emotion was coming from. None of us do. But positive emotions can come from very unhealthy places. When I was in this state, my headcanon was just, I'm a badass, I'm the f***ing man, I'm so much better than you, I'm working so hard. So yeah, call it a defense of gaslighting, call it whatever you want to call it. But the fact of psychology, a fact that I couldn't accept until it happened to me, is that our emotions can lie to us. Which is absolutely terrifying. But real life implications aside, this does open up a whole new dimension of opportunity for writers. Which brings me to HBO's I see this show as the exemplar of self-deception in writing, and I'm about to spoil the whole thing. That's your warning. It's awesome. I first want to say that if your reason for not liking the finale was that Barry didn't kill everyone, turn the video off. It's past your bedtime. The Barry genocide route ending wouldn't have even begun to tie up all of the show's loose ends. Yes, it would have been cool if they gave him a big final gunfight, but like, use your imagination. We've seen Barry kill a bunch of people before. Moving on though, what I love about Barry is that it explores what characters consciously want, and it explores what they do to get what they consciously want. But it also explores the third axis, that is, the unconscious. Sometimes characters will do stuff in Barry that's like, wait, is that, that doesn't make sense, what? What's the justification for that? Until you realize that there is a whole nother world under the surface that could arouse behavior. I tend to get so caught up in Game of Thronesing everything, you know, turning the story into a battleground of conscious ambitions, that I forget about this part. Barry is a type six. The type six's core need is for security. Sometimes they look for security in group alignment, but on a deeper level, they look for security in purpose. Barry's three major eras in this show are each defined by what he believes is his purpose. The Hitman era, the acting era, and the Jesus era. It's no coincidence that these three purposes are all completely different, because it was never about the actual thing he was devoting his life to, it was simply about the fact that he was devoting his life to something. It was about the fact that he had purpose. The most unhealthy sixes will turn to a higher authority or belief that gives them that purpose and security. Barry does this. At the beginning of the story, it's Fuchs. Oh, God. Looks like the old Barry. Where he had purpose. Oh, no, I just, I I'm sorry, I couldn't find a clip of this. Now, I've heard people call Fuchs an eight. He makes a lot of power plays, he controls Barry for his own gain, and his mind frequently goes to vengeance when he's wronged, which looks like an eight. But that being said, Fuchs is an incredibly self-deceptive person, and towards the end of the show, Bill Hader and Alec Berg take one element of his personality, him being a military poser, and turn it into the crux of his entire arc. There's that one scene in season three where he talks to Jim Moss in the car about Vietnam, and Jim Moss is very much an eight, and the difference between them is in night and day. Fuchs is a total bullshitter. Fuchs gets extremely insecure when he realizes that Moss is the genuine article and he's just faking it. But at the end of his arc, Fuchs finally admits to being a soulless poser, and as a reward for this, the story allows him to become the badass killer and the nurturing father figure he always pretended to be. That kind of sounds like a healthy three finally breaking out of their image. Of course, in this case, healthy doesn't necessarily mean morally good, it just means self-aware and self-actualized. If you go back over the series and look at the moments where Fuchs is truly emotional, you start to see that he doesn't really know what to do with himself. He's great at weaving narratives to manipulate other people, but he himself is extremely dysregulated when it comes to his emotional bond with Barry. He flip-flops between what seems to be genuine love and vitriolic hatred. There's always this sense that Barry owes him love, which is a very two thing, so I think the crux of figuring out Fuchs is which motivation is the deepest. Again, the Enneagram isn't an explanation for everything a person does, it's just about finding the core. And I think the core of Fuchs is his image. He lies to himself. Why? Well, Barry lies to himself so that he can have a sense of security and purpose and Fuchs lies to himself so that he can feel important and special even though deep down he knows he's not. 
I think Fuchs is a three, even if that's something that doesn't quite take shape until later in the series. I think Barry is a show about a six getting dropped into a sea of threes and being ill-equipped to see through their bullshit. Sally and Jean, definitely threes. If you doubted that Fuchs is a three because his manipulation seems so eight, take a look at Sally, this stereotypical three. Her willingness to date Barry directly correlates to how emotionally useful he is to her. He idolizes her and he validates her worth. He listens to her talk about herself endlessly. Consciously, she might think she loves him, but she's using him to scratch an itch on her heart, just like Fuchs. Then we got Hank. People seem to think he's a two, fair enough, but there's also a case for three and Hank. One thing I didn't like about the finale was that it didn't give us a Barry Hank scene. Hank had such a weird emotional attachment to Barry, I would have at least liked an acknowledgement of that. What did it all mean, you know? Hader and Berg definitely found Hank's soul in the Cristobal plotline, and I think that whole journey was perfect, but Hank is strongly implied to be in love with Barry, and the closest thing we get to a resolution of that is their last phone call when Barry is in prison in episode three. And maybe that's enough, but personally I just wanted a little more, maybe an acknowledgement of why Hank's love for Barry existed in the first place, how it was different from his love for Cristobal. Which part of Hank loves Cristobal? Is it the good part or the bad part? For a character who was supposed to die in the first episode, they really carved out a lane for him and he's awesome. I just thought that aspect of his character was never fully paid off. Instead, because this is such a three show, his ending has streaks of three in it. The self-deception aspect of his character takes center stage, just like it did with Fuchs. But unlike Fuchs, Hank can't get over his lie and the story punishes him when i was talking to steven about that i go you know it's it when you're talking to him it's almost more like an aa meeting or something it's not like you know you're persecuting him or something it, it's more about a uh, we have the same disease if you can admit you did this then i'll walk away and it is a a, a feeling of like, because I have it too. I know I can relate to you. It's just interesting that Hank's threeness came so late in the game. Like the idea that he got Cristobal killed, but he feels so much shame that he's become someone else. That's a three. A two's big lie is that they confuse a selfish show of love with actual love. Healthy twos have to ask, am I really helping you or am I building up capital? But Hank's love for Cristobal was never built on that toxic reciprocity, at least from what I saw. The self-deceit only kicked in after Cristobal was dead. And I don't know for sure. I realize that I said all fictional characters and all people must be one type. But I only think that because when your back's to the wall, something will take priority. Your deepest core motivation will guide your actions, even if you have other motivations and fears that just aren't as fundamental. There are also, of course, other factors at play in a person that don't directly tie into what the Enneagram covers. Barry has PTSD. He was socially isolated for years. I've heard some people say he's autistic. I don't know much about any of those things, but I do know they can't be written off in a conversation about your psychology. There's also another way to think of the Enneagram, which isn't so much about asking what type of person is this, but more about asking what type of behavior is this. When you frame it like that, you open the door to conversations that transcend the individual. Father Richard Rohr, one of the most well-known Enneagram theorists in the US, likes to describe countries in Enneagram terms. He says America is a type three culture. We cling to utility above all else. When we want reassurance, we look at the results. Our politicians, our salespeople, no patience, everything is slim and refined and ultimately validation seeking because it's not okay to just exist. He says Italy is a type two culture and he cites the massive importance of reciprocity within families and owing people. He says that Japan and France are type four cultures and that Germany is a type six culture. Not because a certain percentage of Germans are sixes, but because when you personify the German culture, you allegedly find a character who is obsessed with finding the right alignment, the right purpose, the theory of everything to make all your anxiety go away. That's the crux of 19th century German philosophy. In terms of storytelling applications, this means you could represent a fictional culture as a type. What's valued the most in this culture? What's feared the most. Ultimately, the Enneagram is about underlying intentions, but perhaps not necessarily the intentions of people. This is a smooth transition into the MBTI segment, as in Myers-Briggs, as in the 16 personalities. Initially, I planned on doing one giant personality theory video, but then I was like, eh. so I opted for three separate videos, Enneagram, MBTI, and Attachment Theory. The attachment theory video is going to be huge and it's going to go hard, but the MBTI video, not so much. I realized that I had very little to say, so I figured I'd just tack it onto this video. It's become cool to say that the Enneagram is the real one and the MBTI is- oh! 
but I don't think this is a good way of looking at it. Because again, personality theories are clinical tools. There is no real or fake. There's just helpful and unhelpful. So in terms of becoming a healthier and more self-aware person, is the MBTI helpful? Well, while the Enneagram is about getting to core motivations, the MBTI tries to be more all-encompassing. In ways, its groups are more specific. I'm an ENTJ and a 3, but I'd probably have more in common with a group of ENTJs than I would with a group of 3s, because the ENTJ is one of 16 types and the 3 is only one of 9. Now, on a personal level, I would recommend the Enneagram as a means of getting to the bottom of yourself. But after you figure out your Enneagram type, not by taking a test, but by reading and relating, then you might as well go and figure out your MBTI. It's more scattered, more superficial, it functions as a set of archetypes, and it personifies them to what I would consider a harmful degree. But if you stack it on top of the Enneagram, it can be potentially helpful because of its specificity. That said, on a writing level, I don't recommend wasting time on the MBTI, because it just doesn't tackle core motivations with the same intensity that the Enneagram does, and core motivations are the guiding light of storytelling. If the Enneagram is purpose, the MBTI is mostly personality, and on this channel I say purpose over personality, meaning you need to construct that framework of deep desires and fears for your character before you start giving them quirks and temperaments. Bottom line, the MBTI just isn't suited for depth in the way that the Enneagram is. With that out of my system, the last thing I want to talk about, and probably the most important, is how the Enneagram can optimize collaboration between writers. If you know what your type is, you can get a better understanding of what your blind spots are. And if you know what your blind spots are, you'll know how to choose the best collaborators for you. As a three, I'm very objective. I'm good at efficiency and cutting corners. I pride myself on my ability to take complex ideas and make them simple, engaging, and digestible. However, like I said earlier, I exist in the art space, where aesthetics and feelings and novelty tend to make or break a project. Fortunately for me, though, the art space is teeming with type fours. That subjective angle that's their whole thing. They excel at it. They tend to have good taste. So creatively, I know that I need a type 4 partner to balance out my hyper-efficiency with apathy. And boy, do they need me. The purest, most stereotypical example of a type 4 writer would be someone who writes on vibes alone. You know, the pantsers. People who say stuff like inspiration. I have never used the word inspiration as a writing coach. That word means nothing to me. To my brain, this is problem solving. Plain and simple. But to a four, it's all inspiration, it's all subjective, it all comes from within. So we need each other, threes and fours. I will say this though, I think a three artist can get further on their own than a four artist can. The fours I've met tend to think that the only two variables in career success are the quality of the art and luck. Whether that be the luck of what parents they were born to or the luck of somebody noticing their work. But threes know that there's a game to be played. Take Lil Nas X for example. This man is an absolute menace of a three artist. Oh my god, he's awesome. I'm totally claiming him for the threes. I don't actually know this, but come on. There was absolutely nothing lucky about how he marketed Old Town Road in 2019. He made intelligent moves and they paid off. The song itself was catchy enough, yeah. He just created some dumb catchy lyrics. He didn't even make the beat. He bought it, I think. And he played his hand extremely well. Three power. But at the same time, Force can have a completely different definition of success. So this isn't really fair. Force can be truly emotionally satisfied with the art itself and not need to weigh it against any external standard like a three does. I think fours would be having a much better time in a world where there were no industries and algorithms where every artist got to exist on the same level playing field and didn't have to worry about paying bills. Whereas that would drive me absolutely insane. Like, I wouldn't mind not having to pay bills, obviously. But I would still be looking for a hierarchy to climb because that's how I measure my self-worth. And of course, I, 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 threes can never get high enough. That's our problem. So fours kind of have something we need emotionally too, which is having real inner identity and self-esteem. I've had conversations with type four writers that have really broken me down and forced me to question why I am the way I am. And that's a very healthy thing. And there are artists of other types who have a lot to bring to the conversation too. Again, the Enneagram is not about behavior. It's about the reasons behind that behavior. If you're creative, and I don't mean an on-off hobbyist, I mean like creativity is a major part of who you are, 
Comment your Enneagram type. Tell me what your art means to you, what you get out of it. I love having those conversations. I know I didn't dive completely into the technicalities of the Enneagram and the subconscious. That's not what this video was. There are so many better resources and more knowledgeable people out there for that. I just wanted to sell these tools that have played such a big part in shaping my mind and my creative process. You don't have to literally consciously implement the Enneagram or any frameworks into your writing. Just by exposing yourself to them, you're broadening your mind. This stuff can only help you. So give it a chance, and we'll learn together. Hey, look at you. You made it to the end of the video. I um, just want to say thank you to all of the patrons. Basically, the lifeblood of my channel. This would not be possible without you. Um, 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 I suppose you can expect another video from me in four weeks, five weeks, you know, I've been trying to take it a little easier. So uh, as much as I do love making videos, what other stuff I want to do, you know, work life balance. That's what it's all about. That should be enough time for him to all scroll. Anyways, cheers. Take it easy.